And we want to do, share some praise reports and prayer requests uh, before we move on to the message. Uh, so so that, means, that means Anne and Cindy have microphones. And so if you'd like to, to share one out here where we can see it, can hear it. So um, this gets us all caught up. Summertime, as you know, people are missing, like, like myself. And, um, and so we want to hear if you have some, some yeah, a season, yeah. So there. I have a praise. I had an opportunity to be with the youth group yesterday at the Alive Festival. Mm -hmm. We have a wonderful group of children between the two churches. Um, so well-mannered, so bright, so energetic. But they had a good time, too. And it was very meaningful. Hey, great. We're glad to hear it. And anybody else with a praise report, prayer request? Oh, there. Yeah. Okay. Sandy. I want to thank God for um, my grandson had an operation uh, on his eye this week, and he's healing. Hopefully, no more operations will be needed. So. Praise that everything's worked out there. His care that he needs is um, being taken care of by his parents. And I pray also I want to praise God for our son, Robin. He was in the hospital a couple of weeks ago with heart issues, um, nothing serious at this point. He's able to manage things with medication. So uh, thank God for that. That was quite a scare. Um, also, he may have some procedures ahead of him on his heart so keep him in prayer his name is robin and my uh, grandson's name is daniel thank you okay anyone else you had a chance well and thank you good to good to hear and let us let us just be in a place of prayer Lord, we want to, just now, give you thanks and praise. Lord, we've sung our praises. Lord, our hearts, we consider now all the goodness you have shown to us, the beauty of your world, the hand that you have had on our lives, the healings you have performed, the miracle power that has been at work, and your Son given to us for salvation. Lord, we ask that you bless the sick, that you come alongside those that are that are seeking healing just now and for the ones listed in the bulletin we, we remember each and every one of those lord and our cancer patients and and others that that have have something long term that's something that that doesn't easily solve we just ask lord that there be this be a week where there's encouragement and help be alongside those that are having dialysis be alongside lord those that grieve Sue Whitmer's family, would you, we lift up particularly. Lord, we, we thank you for the, the help that's been given to Daniel for his eye and for Robin, and just ask, Lord, that you confirm and, and watch over them. Lord, but we thank you for, for your, your, your hand in our lives and the, the, that right now the, you, you've given the youth a, a, a time at the Alive Festival, and just ask, Lord, that you confirm and come alongside them. For, for the good that has been given, Lord, just, just, uh, just set it deep within their hearts. Use it for encouragement and counsel for their lives. Lord, we pray for our, our households and our families, for the family that is far away and for those that we see often. Ask, Lord, that our, that our speech and our, and our actions be, be seasoned with your grace and your faithfulness and your forgiveness. Lord, would you provide for those whom we, we know best and love best? Would you heal the sick and uphold those who are struggling to find the right means to get along? We ask, Lord, you bless our neighbors. I ask, Lord, that you bless the churches in this community, bringing them, Lord, to a, a message of the gospel that hearts will respond to. We ask you, that you bless the church that is not free in so many lands. And where there's persecution and trouble and danger and terror and sore, Lord, help them to be more than conquerors in all these things. Lord, we pray that those places that have not known peace for a long time would have the hand of, of your hand to bring peace to those, those nations, allow people to move back into their homes and, and build communities again 
and walk without fear. Do justice indeed along the among the nations, Lord, but with your mercy and your care, direct each nation, direct this nation, Set your hands on the hearts of the leaders to guide them in the ways you would have them to go. Be the defender, Lord, and the provider for this United States of America. Lord, would you bless us, Lord, to, to know that your faithfulness can be counted on for each need. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in the secret places of our heart. Lord, for what we've left unspoken and all that we have brought, we give you praise, and we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I would, I'm going to read to you from uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 17, and, uh, and we are here, I was, as I was looking at the scriptures and at, at uh, one of the times I was going through and, and reading and, and studying the scriptures, it came to, I kept un underlining the word forever, and I got to, I got to five forevers in, in this, this, uh, these six verses. And so it reads like this, David speaking in prayer to God. And you made your people Israel to be your people forever, and you, O Lord, became their God. And now, O Lord, let the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his household be established forever, and do as you have spoken. And your name will be established and magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, is Israel's God. And the house of your servant David will be established before you. For you, my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build a house for him. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray before you. And now, O Lord, you are God, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now you have been pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue forever before you. For it is you, O Lord, who have blessed, and it is blessed forever. Lord, might you touch us to know your, your word, to understand, to hear, and our hearts to respond. Let this be a holy time, one directed by your spirit. This in Jesus' name, amen. Now, um, well, I, I could as, as easily have taken that passage and underlined all the times that David refers to himself as the Lord's servant. So there, there are five times in there, and I count, I counted as I was, I was reading through. The concept of something is going on that's going to last forever. Uh, it comes of this this point where David had risen to the kingship. Israel is uh, united behind him. They're in this Jerusalem is now the capital city, and he had determined, well, what shall we do next? He tossing around quite quite realistically, the idea of building a temple for God, that God would be worshipped <coughs> there in the, in the city of Jerusalem, and that would be the center of, of people's devotion, be, the, be a place of grace. And as we know, that temple, indeed, God, it was his will to build that, but he said, not you, not yet. In fact, God said, I'm going to do something for you first, which is interesting. He's, David's coming in gratitude to, to bring to God a great, you know, the greatest gift he could think to do. And God says, no, actually, there's more that I want to do for you before we get to that point. I'm going to build you your house. Using that idea, God, David wanted to build a house for the worship of God. And, but his house, which means his line, the kings that would follow after him, those that would would rule in his place after he's gathered to his fathers. I'm going to build your house, your, the house of David. And we know that that is something that God certainly did do because, because you're going to get to the Christmas story where, you know, that is going to be said, to you was born in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. When finally Jesus is born in Bethlehem about a thousand years later. Now, God says, I will build a house for you. I will establish, a, you know, kings to reign upon this throne. And then he 
adds something else. In verse 12, he says, I shall establish his throne forever. Now that is interesting because what king can possibly reign forever? What, what, kings, what king, and it, and it is written, I'll establish his throne. That one particular descendant from, from the line of David. God speaks to David not only of the, that he will establish a kingship and a, and a rule and authority that is temporal, that's material in, in Israel, is indeed a blessing. It is right in the line of what God is trying to do in Israel at that time, but also he would bring the Messiah from the line of David. God has, through the Old Testament, been, been narrowing down f from which family the Messiah would be born, from the line of of Seth, son of Adam, to then, of course, through Noah, but also through Shem. From Shem to Abraham. From Abraham down to, to Jacob's children. Jacob's, of Jacob's children, Judah. From the line, line and tribe of Judah came David. And from David's line and his, his descendants, the Messiah will be born. So David has heard two pieces of news. God is going to build his house, is going to be present in, in what David is doing and, the, and uh, be the one who establishes the rule of, the, of the, this David and his descendants in Jerusalem. And also God will be bringing that Messiah out of that whole project. He's and he's going to establish a throne forever. It is the Messiah that reigns forever. Kings do not reign forever. David had seen kings die. He had seen kings tossed away from their thrones. He'd seen kingdoms fall. But the one who will reign, whose this throne will be established forever, that individual is, is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So David is captivated by this. He's, he's heard this word forever. And so, as it says, he does something which is, which is good to see. In verse 16, just there before we got to the reading, then King David went in and sat before the Lord. What he said when he sat before the Lord is, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? Now we learn two very, very important things. See, David's life is supposed to be instructive. David's life works several ways. First off, he prefigures Christ. He points to Christ with things about his life, things that were, that were self-sacrificing, things that were redemptive, things that pointed to the victory of Jesus. All these occur in David's life. And David is also a, a, a one who points to devotion. And this business of going to God and saying, God, I might have come here with ideas, but I suddenly realize I don't even know how I deserve to be receiving all that you're giving to me. Now, I'm, I might say, I, I come to God sometimes with a, with, with a heck of a list of things that I think should happen, ought to be occurring right now, that are wrong and need to be better. I'm a little thin, and I'm uneven on who am I that you have brought me this far. So we have that, and we have that David goes in and sits before the Lord. That's about the only thing I want to bring the, the Bible study notes that, that one can find on, on texts like this, where, where this, because people noted, well, he didn't go in and kneel, he didn't go in and stand and, or fall on his face, he's sitting before the Lord, and, and as best people can say is, well, that was where, how you approached a king. You might sit probably upon the ground, chairs were thinner in that day, that's why the king had a throne, nobody else got one. You'd sit on the ground, you'd bow to ask the king for what favor you wanted to ask. This is how you went before a king. Now that's fascinating. Because David's just been made king. I mean, it's not that long ago he was, he was uh, an outlaw when King Saul was ruling. And then there was, a, there was a war thing and going on. And he's king now. But it doesn't apparently crowd his life to go before God as his king king. Now, I think, I think that's worth 
looking at it a little closer because we are so used to David saying religious things because he invented most of the religious things that are said in the Psalms, you know, that, you know, holy art thou and praise unto thee and, and, uh, the, and all the things that the Psalms say in prayer and praise to God, so many of them came from David's pen and we just think he just talks like that. It's not necessarily true that someone who was an elevated to a kingship, who has won battles, who has armies at his command, who has a whole capital city all, all fresh, freshly planted there for them and, and, and has unified a whole nation behind him, it's not necessarily given that he's going to turn around and say, oh, God is my king. Now, I don't know if you, in your days, at some point when you were young, probably you wondered what would happen if you were suddenly made king or queen. I know some of you thought about that. I know if you were given peace and quiet to daydream on a summer day, you know, you might wonder if I was made king or if I was queen, right? Now, that's, that seems unlikely, but we can well imagine what it would be like to become wealthy enough to be beyond care, to be on the danger of circumstances, to be untouchable by misfortune because we've just got so much back. In fact, to where we don't suppose we'll have an, an unmet desire. If you want a boat, you can buy a boat. If you want a plane, you can buy a plane. There's people that wealthy. Now, let's leave out the super rich as we discuss this because we don't really know any of them except what we hear in the news. And that's but I've known people who were wealthy. I mean, they were seriously wealthy. They, they, there's nothing they were going to lack, ever. Now, it might interest you that that, that was to them more of a call to prayer than, than you'd ever suppose because it's, it's such a responsibility. God has given you all that, and you're steward of all that. And also, they were ones, the actual wealthy people that I knew, that I know, that it took them right to their knees. Because you were very much aware then, once you had the money that everybody wanted, that money doesn't do it. It doesn't fix broken hearts. It doesn't call back wayward children and grandchildren. It doesn't fix the problem with your niece or nephew. It doesn't solve the trouble in your church or your, in your community. It doesn't change the community that you love, there's no, not enough money to do that. It's a thing that has to happen in the heart. It doesn't solve your problem of your own conscience and your own... Do you get where I'm at? The person that has... You might think you might have had plans if you became so wealthy that you could get what... I would, I would buy a boat. That's what I would get because I don't really want a boat for myself in this life because I think it would be too much work and too much money. But if there was enough money to have everybody else handle the details boat. Okay. Now, you might think that, that that's what it would all be about, but you'd find out quickly that there you have a king in God. There are circumstances in life that are greater than what your resources can do, and you're going to be quickly in prayer. That's been my experience of the, the people I've known who've had a lot. Probably one reason you, the, the arc of Abraham Lincoln's story was the way it was. Because, you know, when he was, when he was running for Congress and debating and campaigning as it was, he was cagey about his religion. As far as we know, that he just knew that if he joined a Presbyterian church, all the Baptists would hate him and they wouldn't vote for him. If he joined a Baptist church, all the Methodists would hate him and they wouldn't vote for him. 1800s were a really contentious time and he had to deal with that reality. But he gets in office as president of the United States. And I know there, the Civil War was, was dodgy at a time and there were defeats, but he's still at the mightiest nation, largest army on the globe is at his command. And that was when he was driven to his knees to pray. There were defeats in the battlefield. His son Willie passed away. Then it was known that the president was praying had not been well known that Lincoln was a man of prayer until he attained the highest office in the land. So David, 
as king goes in to acknowledge that God is king. And he begins to, begins something that we should begin right off with, recognizing God as king. It's not just that, you, you know, God has rules and you'll keep those rules and then he ought to be happy with that. No, he has your loyalty. He is, he's, he's, he's the one writing all, what your story is actually about. It is not about you, it is about him, if he is king. And you remember verses like Matthew 6, which says that Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Now, I would, I would look at that and I would know, well, I've got to think about some righteousness and I should be seeking righteousness. That's, that's not bad advice. That's exciting. I'm going to seek his kingdom and I'm thinking about the things that God brings and the project that God is trying to undertake and, and just whatever is in my mind that is about God's kingdom. And, but, and that is all right. That is all correct. Do not, do not lose lose the vision of what is what is God's will for your life and follow that but also add to it if you're seeking the kingdom of God you're seeking Jesus as king actually has rule and authority over your life and he's not a king in theory he's not a king kind of written down Jesus is technically king of everything he's alive and it's useless to try to try to debate the point, or to hide things from him, total waste of time, he is king. Which takes us away from this idea that, well, what would you do if you had immense wealth, or what would you do if everybody suddenly decided to do whatever you wanted as if you were king? We already have that problem just in a smaller scale. I have my desires, and I let, let that rule the day or the week. I have my agenda, and I'll go into things saying, this is what it's going to be about, and it's got my name at the top. It's all about me. I am just, just, just drunken. I'm not drunken. Drunken with agency. I, have, I can make choice. You realize I can decide what I do, think, and say, and God doesn't reach down and smack me on the head if he doesn't like it. It's, it's given me agency and choice. And this, this kind of power is intoxicating. I don't need to be super rich to be doing it all for me. Except if I would surrender and say God is king. That I seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. David has come to that point. He is at the heap of whatever one could expect to accomplish in his Iron Age era, he is a king at the head of a nation, of a mighty army, and a string of victories, and wealth, and what all else. Oh, he's got popularity, dash, style, and, and culture, too. He's got it all. But he's not captivated by this, and he's not asking for more of this. He's not asking for more victories over his enemies, or more wealth to be added, or an extra tunefulness to his voice as he sings the psalms of Israel. He is captivated by that God has listed five forevers in his mind. God has promised things that are forever to happen. He has seen beyond what we can get today or tomorrow or for a whole lifetime of striving. He said, let's think about things that are forever. And so he declares five forevers. So on the advice of no one that you should have five points in your sermon, I'm going to talk about five forevers. I do not mind if you check them off as we go through. Sometimes helps us concentrate. It might take us an hour and 15 minutes, I don't know. So anyway, the first forever is, is there in verse 40 to 22. It says, and you made your people Israel to be your people forever. And you, O Lord, became their God. He is pointing out that God has confirmed and accomplished and established what his will was when he called Israel out from slavery in Egypt. 
they have now become their own nation in the promised land with God's worship at the center. You realize David coming to the kingship, though it's something we feel is obvious, of course, it's the Bible. David has to become king. But David coming to the kingship was as much a reform as anything else. It was a picture of a time when Israel changed their hearts and started looking to the things of God rather than the things of man. Israel was not in a good place before David came along. They were, they'd, they'd had a good time under Samuel, but that began to fracture, and King Saul was a mess, and the time before that, in the book of Judges, just read about it, it's shocking. David's time is a time of, of reform and renewal in their life, and so David is saying, now we understand who we are as a people. God is, Israel is, God's people, and that's forever. And you, O oh Lord, became their God. So I can now be saying that not only does Israel live in covenant, do my people, is my nation in covenant with God, that our, we are living in accountability to God, we are living with a mission from God, we're fulfilling God's purpose for his, for his world that's going to co- go right through the, the life of the Jewish people, but God is also faithfully living in covenant with us. In other words, whatever is going on is their history is now his story. The work of God to redeem humankind and to bring his knowledge, knowledge of God to men and women is going to go right through Israel and right through the life of King David. It's all about you, God. And you have established this. You've made this to happen. And it is true forever. For the church that now stands in a, in in relationship to God as Israel stood in relationship to God is just that, where we're saying, my story is actually his story. In fact, his story is my history. It's not about me. What is happening here is God is actually doing his thing through my life and through yours. And in fact, it's very helpful as we live in our times, 3,000 years after David, that that we we have that feeling that sometimes we're just flailing through history. The only, the only time I'm, I'm unhappy in the morning is when I'm just ready to check the news, right? Otherwise, it's one sweet song. Coffee, cereal, little, little, see what friends are doing. But when I got to check the news, this is, oh, I don't want to see. That's not entirely true if God is acting out his purposes and his will in the life of the church, and he is. And this is true forever. Second, he says, And now, O Lord, let the word that you have spoken concerning the servant, is verse 23, and concerning his house be established forever and do as you have spoken. Well, there's one thing of advice in there is there's nothing wrong with praying to God to do as he promises, as he already promised. Realize your agenda when you're going to God, the things you want him to fix and do and everything, do not have the eternal stamp of approval as so much as the things that God has said, this is what I want to accomplish. Have you considered, you know, I've, I, just come to God with your prayer list, your prayers as you can if that's all you got, but sometimes challenge yourself to say, God, make me holy. Let your Holy Spirit dwell in me. Let your, your will, your love be flow through me. Let me be a holy person in your sight and carry the image of Christ. Just say that. That's not so terribly out of, off the wall religious. You understood what I just said, that God, his Holy Spirit, would move in your life, that he would accomplish his will in you. And see what God does with that. David is, again, saying something that God has promised, but it's also he's talking about, let this be established that you said about my house. What is lacking at this point? If Israel has, has a king, David, if they have a capital city, Jerusalem, if their enemies are afraid of them, wherever direction you turn, and people are worshiping God and they're excited about the law and hearing the word of God, and they're even singing all the best hits in the Psalms, fresh and new. What's lacking is the Messiah. That's what David is saying, send your Messiah. Send that one who will make this salvation full and complete, because we know what it looks like when Israel has a few generations to, 
to think about it. They turn every which way but toward God. We know how it is to try to live in light of the righteousness of God on our own. It does not go well. David is saying, accomplish what you have said about my house, that his house would be, would bring forth the Messiah. You see, it is Jesus who brings a complete salvation. I have Hebrews 1.3, just to read it for you. This is what, from the New Testament angle, we see who Jesus is. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and upholds the universe by the word of his power. So good, we have God, but he's also man. God come to be with us. God come to solve this problem. God come to do this when we could not. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Purification for sins, reigning on high with God. Died upon the cross, rose in glory, sits at the right hand of God, not because we needed to get him out of the way so something else could happen. He's at the right hand of God directing what happens next. He's anything but not present. He's at the right hand of the throne where it all flows from. So David is saying, I know what we need. We need the redemptive accomplishment of what the Messiah will bring, that Israel will finally know God because Messiah has come and he will reign. When the Messiah has come and he is reigning, that will complete the work that David's reign and his kingship foreshadowed, a renewal in Israel's heart and a centering around God. The third forever is this. And your name, verse 24, will be established and magnified forever, saying, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, is Israel's God. Do you realize that's very much like saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and your will be done, your kingdom come, on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, we will begin to praise you now. We will be living in your promises now, And this will continue forever. If my life is surrendered to the king who lives forever, will that king leave me in the grave? Will that king leave me to see decay? Will that king leave me out of his kingdom that is forever? No. Israel, faithful Israel, praises God around the throne. The faithful church that has come in generations before is also praising God around the throne. And you and I shall praise God around the throne. This life will end, this time This time will be over, our struggles will cease, trials and temptations being passed, and we will rejoice around the throne forever. Because people who are surrendered to the king are surrendered to the one who lives and who is never not on the throne. David saw nations rise and fall quickly. He certainly is praying when he asks for a Messiah, don't send us another material answer to a, to a material problem. Don't send us another just a leader. We need the one who will make that supreme difference in our lives, that God is present with us and God will never leave us nor abandon us. The fourth forever is this. It's in verse 27. It says, Now you have been pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue forever before you. Now, that's actually is an answer to, to how David feels he can... David put his response before he put what, he, what he's excited about. He said, You have please, been pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue forever before you. And he says in verse 25, Therefore your servant has found courage to pray before you because... God has done this. Because God has blessed the house of David with the coming Messiah. Yeah, I, David is in a place to pray. David is in a place to approach God. David is, a, is in a place to trust God's faithfulness because he has seen all that God has done and heard the promises and heard the words so that he understands what forever means. It means this will not, not be undone. This will be something that God will accomplish. And then he just says, may your will be accomplished in me. I have courage to pray before God because his love has been laid out so in such clear terms. One of the greatest things the New Testament talks about is our access to God through Jesus Christ. 
And the last forever is where he says, it is you, O Lord, who have blessed, and it is blessed forever. Now you realize he didn't have to say blessed twice. It is you, O Lord, who have blessed, and then he could have said forever. But now he says, it is you, O Lord, who have blessed, and it is blessed forever because it's blessed and it's staying blessed. I don't know how else to say it, but just like that. Do you understand that we, could, we need to walk differently? Not saying, oh, I don't know how we'll get, oh, did you hear about that? Oh, this is terrible. No, we are walking in blessing. God is accomplishing his purposes through us. We need to live in some confidence in this. This is, a, this is a statement that our salvation in Jesus is full and complete. The holiness that he brings, the forgiveness that he brings, the power that he brings, the healing that he brings are all things that are present here in the church. And so for us, God has blessed and we are blessed. Think about the faith that that takes. David had come through a very tumultuous time as to become king and the Messiah is another thousand years away. But he sees blessing that is to stay. The perspective of the one writing First Chronicles. Read Chronicles. It, it's writing from the time at least 600 years after David. Five or 600 years after David. Where there had been a lot of bad behavior and disasters and some, oh, just maybe getting things fixed back up but not so very well. He, ex he exercises faith. He knows that Israel might stumble, but God's love is, is supreme. He knows that we might, we might fail of our, of our task, but there is forgiveness and strength in God. He knows that there will be trials and temptations for the church, but we will produce saints and martyrs. The chronicler exercises faith because he, he, can, he can say what David saw. He agrees with it in his heart, and he's still waiting for the Messiah. And we have seen the Messiah. We know that he died upon the cross. There is forgiveness that is stamped in the blood of Jesus. And there is a resurrection that was, that was shown to all the world. And there is now his hand upon our lives because he rules from the throne of God. We should live differently if we have all that going for us. You have blessed and it is blessed. You know, I, I, I don't always respond with religious words when people greet me I don't mind if you do I think that's fine do you want to do the, no please especially if God is telling you to do that but you know what I mean how are you blessed I'm blessed well that's good and in fact that's absolutely true I can't tell you not to say something that's absolutely true now, if you might just understand, I, I try to cultivate an acquaintance of people who don't know anything about God, Jesus, or the Bible, and I don't want to start talking in a different language right away. But that's just me. Because this passage will tell you that it is absolutely true to say, I am blessed. It, it is you, Lord, who have blessed, and it is blessed and it is forever. So Lord, just ask that you bring us to living in a different way. Lord, we, we're looking at the problems and not your mighty power. We're hearing the noise in our own heart and ignoring your, your counsel. We're thinking of our hurts and our diseases and not your healing and your miracle power. Lord, call us to be a holy people. Call us to live in that blessing. Lord, let the heart respond today. My friends, if you want to respond to God, this altar is open. This is not a day to leave something undone, something not, not surrendered to the king, some need not addressed before his throne, some sin that you need to tell him about and receive his forgiveness. You can pray on the one side by yourself. I'll pray with you if you come to this other side. But this God has called you to know this life of blessing that is forever. Amen.